Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 14th, and before we get started, I want to cover a few housekeeping matters. Uh, Last week, we talked about what might happen to the size of a cup of coffee if a per cup tax was put on coffee, and a number of interesting uh, suggestions have been made at econtalk.org at the podcast site for the Willingham podcast where that came up. Uh, and I've given a few hints, so if you want to continue that discussion, please go there. I also want to remind listeners that we have a thorough archive of every podcast that's ever been done here. It's available at uh, econtalk.org. If you look in the left-hand margin, you'll see it organized by date, category, and guest. So if you're interested in whether we've interviewed someone in the past and you're usually listening, listening to us via iTunes where you don't have a complete archive, the complete archive is available at econtalk.org. I also want to remind listeners that we are on Twitter at EconTalker, E-C-O-N-T-A-L-K-E-R. My guest today is Mike Munger of Duke University, longtime guest. Uh, always happy to have you back, Mike. How are you? It's, it's, it's my favorite part of every month we get to do this. Well, you are a very popular guest, so as long as that remains true, I guess yeah, I'll have to have you on. It. It's just it's me catering to the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Without price signals, which is ironic because that's our topic for today. Uh, our topic really came from a uh, email I received from a listener, Caleb Cangelosi, and it builds on earlier podcast uh, material that we did on um, on gouging. And Caleb was curious about. The limits to prices and markets and how far you and I might go or anyone might go in advocating the use of prices and markets for allocating scarce stuff, particularly in the area of healthcare and particularly in the area of vaccines. So the question I want to start us off with is if you have a life-saving vaccine or at least a potentially life-saving vaccine, do we really want to let the market set the price Um, or do we want to use – non-market ways of allocating, non-price ways of allocating uh, that scarce good. Uh, there often isn't an, enough to vaccine to go around. And certainly, well, I, I, I have a question first. Are, are we actually limited by the, um, the physical rules of the universe around us, or can we make up an alternative world? If we can make up an alternative world where people always do what we think is the right thing and we're altruistic, we might not want to have price. We might want to have people working for the public good with full information and with all the right individual incentives and the resources they need to do their job. Yeah, no cost of production or discovery would be a we're talking about what we want, that. maybe we want that. And I think I think a lot of medical people think we live in that world. <laughs> or, yeah, I just I can't help but notice that this is uh, a time when a lot of economists are starting to wonder whether we – live in our own world where we assume yeah. <laughs> assume people behave in a certain way and that's the reality we live in. And So I just want to mention that offhand. Well, but, but, um, it's, it's fair enough to say that maybe economists live in their own world. So let's, let's try something kind of fundamental. Let, 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 the question is, suppose we don't have enough stuff and we're worried about two things. We're worried about how to allocate stuff and how to choose a system where there's more stuff to allocate. Both of those things are a problem we have to handle. If you look just at the how do we allocate the stuff we have, it seems like price isn't fair because it means that we don't have enough and the rich are going to get more and that doesn't seem right. It violates some what philosophers call moral intuition. Yeah, I'm not sure, by the way, that uh, I, I want to challenge that. We'll come back to it, but the, whether the rich really get more. It's true that, that price can price some people out of the market on the basis of income. But it is not always true. Uh, well, the, the, even if it were true, or even if, it, if it's in the sense that wealthy people would have some advantage, they wouldn't get all of it, but they'd have some advantage. Fair enough. What people 
ignore, and I don't understand this, is the importance, the importance of the responsiveness of the amount of stuff we have to the mechanism we choose for allocating the stuff that we have. Think of the ways that we can allocate. One we could use is price. One we can have, we can have people queue up. They can line up, and we don't have enough of it, but people who are first in line get it. We could use a lottery. We could say everybody gets a lottery ticket, and you know we'll we'll choose. We could use authority. We could say uh, that scientists have studied this, and they think you need it more than you. We could use personal preference or favoritism. Now we probably think that's a bad idea, but in fact, a lot of the schemes that we choose end up unintentionally inc- increasing the amount of favoritism that maybe somebody who's going to hire someone. Um, in the context of a minimum wage, or maybe a local official in the face of a shortage, um, th- those sorts of restrictions are going to increase the opportunities for personal favoritism. Or we could set up a rent-seeking contest, and we could make the likelihood that you get it uh, proportional to how hard you try, how long a proposal you write, how much time and effort, how much money you burn in order to to write the the application. I was like a ditch digging contest. You, yeah. you, you have, uh, if you want the scarce thing, uh, you've got to dig as large a, di- a ditch as possible. And then could, it's understood you have to fill it back in too. You could do that and make it more interesting. You could do it by height. Uh, you could do it by weight. Yeah. You could do it by beauty, subjective or objective. Uh, there'd be all kinds of different ways that we could deal with the fact that <clears throat> in general there isn't enough stuff to go around. I think part of the reason that people don't like price for making that decision uh, is that it is impersonal. I, l- let me suggest two reasons and, and you can comment. One is price does two things. It allocates. That is, it decides some people will choose not to buy it at at the particular price, whether it's uh, luxury cars, uh, the the nth pair of shoes, or or a vaccine. So one thing it does is it allocates. And economists tend to focus on that. I think a lot of what non-economists focus on is it also redistributes between buyer and seller in within any transaction. So my loss as a buyer looks like your gain, which is true as a seller. And therefore, it looks like, though it is not, it looks like a zero-sum game where a seller profits at the buyer's expense. Now, that's certainly true for any one transaction we think of a different price. So if – this is the key – if the transaction is going to take place, higher prices means more for the seller and less for the buyer. What I think we often forget about is the point you're making, which is that that if is very important because it may not take place, in which case the buyer will be – even worse off. And that's something, of course, uh, that we want to worry about. We can change the buyer into a, a non-buyer. The, the thing about shortages is that for many people, particularly if the shortage is unnecessary, and what I mean by unnecessary is that if we used a different scheme, there would be more of this stuff. And let's, let's call it vaccine. Let's say we're talking about vaccines. There are notorious shortages in the United States for vaccines in the sense that um, when people want to have a vaccine, particularly against flu, it almost always comes in kind of late. There's not enough. Now, it's true that it's not very expensive. It's pretty cheap once you actually get it. But there's there's a long line, in effect, that you have to wait for. And it reminds me of people used to, when they used to want to buy meat or sausage in Poland or the former Soviet Union. You'd have to check and see if your local butcher actually had meat that day. Most days they don't. And, oh, what a big day. I've heard that the butcher has meat. People run down and they stand in line, and the first 10 people or so are able to buy. They're able to buy at the state-sponsored price, which is ridiculously low. So the fact is that the reason there may not be much meat in the front window of the butcher shop is he's selling it out the back because it, it's worth quite a bit more. Now, I doubt if we have – I've never heard of this. Maybe you have, Russ. I don't know that we have a black market in vaccine in the U.S. I'm confident we would if H1N1, the swine flu vaccine, the, the swine flu, uh, became much more virulent. We might very well have a black market because we don't have enough of the vaccine. Yeah, by the way, people from the former Soviet Union, when they came to the United States, uh, would often carry – large sums of cash on them, thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars. And I'd ask them why they would carry so much money. And they said, well, what if there's a TV? 
yeah. available for sale because usually there were no TVs in the stores. But if it was the day that the TVs were available at the state-sponsored price, the last thing you'd want to have happen is not have that cash on hand. And so people would often carry – when they until they adjusted to life in the United States, would carry a lot more cash than the average American because of that uh, uncertainty of, of the supply. But in the case of, of vaccines, isn't the problem just a physical problem? I'll say, isn't it just a physical problem, Mike? That that, that Mike means that I'm I'm playing devil's advocate here. Isn't yeah. it true that this is just – I mean the reason there's a shortage for a vaccine in the United States is it, it takes a while to produce it and you just can't make it fast enough. Isn't that the source of the problem, not the prices? You know, it's, it's, it's actually quite possible that that's true. It might be that the price is high enough to elicit really hard efforts um, from pharmaceutical manufacturers, but the fact is – uh, in the last two years, three large manufacturers have left the business. They have de- they have decided that they can't make any profits, and they can't even actually guarantee the employment of their workers enough. So they- they've left the business. So it is a physical problem in the sense that three large companies have decided it's not even worth trying. Now, perhaps if the government's going to buy General Motors, maybe they could buy some of these companies and go into the business themselves. But that sort of misses the point. If for some reason, it's not profitable for the private sector to produce this. There must be something about the way that we're compensating or giving signals to the private sector about the value of these vaccines that's not getting through. Because I think if you ask most people, they say, this vaccine's really valuable to me. I really want one. And there's two different kinds right now, the the regular flu vaccine and the H1N1. And I don't know if people are confused or they're just kind of conflating them. But um, right now, Walgreens, for example, which gives the regular flu vaccine, has already given twice as many as it did all of last year just for flus, just in this flu season, which really doesn't start until December. They're probably... They're probably selling more flutes too. I mean, you're right. I think people are a little bit confused, but there's yeah. also just a higher <laughs> level of anxiety, right? I, yeah. People are just nervous, and and flu can kill you uh, if you're old or young or frail. And both, you know, I don't think I think it's a little, the 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 swine flu thing is is interesting because I think it's not particularly different from flu, at least right now. It's the yeah. possibility that it could be. And so it's that worry has generated a lot more concern. There have been a total of 600 deaths in the U.S. from swine flu. We have 36,000 deaths from flu every year in the United States. And that's, uh, again, mostly a particular uh, – people who are particularly vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so going back to either – and by the way, we're talking about flu, but of course there are many, many other vaccines that are, that are crucial and important. And as you point out, uh, the number of producers – has fallen dramatically over time. And, and my claim has always been, and I suspect it's true, I like to think it's true, is that we've taken the profit out. We've not allowed the marketplace to work in the vaccine area. We've basically said, if you come up with a better vaccine or a quicker vaccine, or you can produce it uh, in larger numbers, uh, and that's going to cost you more, we're not going to let you profit from that in an inordinate amount because it's just not right. And as a result, because the government is the major purchaser of these vaccines, which is another non-market aspect of this, uh, we're not going to let the price be what the market could bear. And as a result, there seems to be frequent shortages. There are frequent shortages, and it it is interesting that we have decided that this is apparently too important to let the market do it. And so we're going to put the Department of Motor Vehicles in charge of it with all of their efficiency and uh, politeness. Why, well, is it, I, I, why is it that you think that government is going to be better at doing this? I think and the reason I, I, I say it in that provocative way is what you said before is right. I think it's the heart of the matter. We, we have a sense that it's wrong to use the profit motive at all as a way of organizing production that's involved in serving really desperate needs. So if if somebody really needs something, then no one should ever profit from serving that need. And and we've talked about the emotional aspect of this in our other podcast, but I want to bring up an example that happened to me the other day, which is really illuminating. Uh, Someone was talking about the swine flu. It was a doctor. It was a couple of doctors, actually, I was chatting with. And I made an offhand remark that, yeah, well, there's a shortage of swine flu because we don't let anybody profit from it. And 
uh, she, being a doctor, was saying that she would be getting her supplies soon, <laughs> which is always <laughs> interesting, you know, because yeah. for I think reasonably, it's a good idea if we're going to not let the market allocate it. Probably, healthcare people should get it first because they're going to come into contact with it a lot and come in contact with vulnerable people. So it's probably a good idea. Yeah. But when I said, you know, the reason it's a short in short supply is because we don't let anybody profit from it, she immediately said something that I think is commonly uh, believed and felt by most people, which is, well, I wouldn't trust a vaccine that was produced by somebody who was trying to make a, a quick profit or take advantage of people. And I thought that really captured a lot of the emotional uh, and philosophical view that people have of the point you're making, the idea that price or profit or markets should play a role in urgently uh, desperate situations. And um, of course, she charges for her services. And when if I had went to her with my child, she's a wonderful pediatrician, if I went to her with my child and said, I don't want to uh, pay for your services today because I don't think it would be – I wouldn't trust you. Oh, but the, because your child is really sick. It's really fine. sick. It's fine for your child to go when it's not sick. But today, he's really sick. So I don't trust you if I have to pay you. A lot, especially if I have to pay yeah. you a lot for this. Yeah. And, of course, I, I didn't say that, but she'd have been horrified by that accusation that, yeah. that she'd be somehow exploiting me or taking advantage of me. And and she's a very good person, I'm sure. Yeah. In that situation, she would, eat, would even be an – even better doctor at no price. Uh, and she, and so it, there is an, a fundamental truth to her observation, which is that we'd like to rely on – I like to think of it as love uh, and affection and, and decency as a way to get stuff done. But it's very hard to rely on that for the swine flu. It's not working. You – you might very well be able to rely on it at the margin, certainly for doctors. She needs to cover something like what economists call the average cost or what the – she has a bunch of costs she has to cover. She went to medical school. But at the margin, she's happy to help people. problem is that we, the shortages occur at the margin, and vaccines are physical things. They're sort of disembodied and impersonal. They just they have to be at a certain level of, of quality. And it is there's a big asymmetry of information i mean think about this russ i went to a, a, a drug store i won't say the name i went to a drug store the other day and got my flu vaccine and a person that i don't know put a needle i don't know where it's been sure. in, into a bottle and pulled a liquid out and then put it into my arm and injected it you're such a fool i, I, I don't go there <laughs> you're, it, you're crazy. It cost me five dollars, but who knows what happened? Yeah, you were so kind of we, trusting. We have this sense, and I and I think rightly, we'd like for us to have some kind of more direct. Now, I'm 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 an economist, and so I was thinking, gosh, this is great. Instead of having to go and make an appointment with a doctor and pay a hundred dollars. I paid five dollars at a drugstore, and this is displacing some of the monopoly, some of the entry barriers that doctors used to have, because there's all sorts of things that physicians' assistants can now do. But yeah. I believe in the quality of impersonal services in the market. By no means does everyone believe that. No, and and it it uh, doesn't always work. Of course, it's not yeah. foolproof. Yeah. Well, but let's go back to the harder question. Um, at a point in time. There is only a physical – a limited amount of, of vaccine available for whatever reason, whether public policy designed it that way or it's – or it just was bad luck or whatever it is. There's not enough to go around at the price that's being charged. Isn't that a good thing? Do we really want to let people decide for themselves and should, do we want our society to, to implicitly decide who lives and dies based on how much you're willing to pay? I mean let's – let me, let me take the example that Greg Mankiw uh, posed in a recent New York Times column. He talked about a uh, – let's say a pill could be designed. He calls it the Dorian Gray pill after the Oscar Wilde uh, character uh, Dorian Gray. Um, every day that you take the, the pill, you don't die. You don't get sick. Uh, you don't even age. You stay exactly the way you are. And a year's supply of this pill costs $150,000. And if you can afford this, you can live forever. So would we want to allow that pill to be bought and sold by uh, the marketplace so that a handful of really rich people could live forever? The rest of us would be dying off. I mean, is that – that's what markets do, isn't it? The, the premise is that there aren't enough of these pills 
for everyone to have one. And in Mankiw's column, it was, let's even suppose that if we devoted all of society's resources to this, if there's a limited supply, we can't much change uh, the amount. So you, you could, because if you could subsidize it and make it so everybody could have one, that would be different. That's not the example. There's not enough. Question is, and we all, we all recognize that it does cost $150,000. A little Question less. Question is, what would be the alternatives? Um, we could uh, do this by authority where we would say, who are the people who are the smartest? Who are the ones who contribute most to the society? And we'll use tax money then to subsidize this. I don't think it's the smartest, by the way, but go ahead. You, uh, maybe you it's kind the of, most beautiful because yeah. you also don't deteriorate <laughs> physically. I would say it is not Matt Holliday, for, for, for my own sake, since he missed that fly ball in the outfield. <laughs> he, he doesn't get the pill. He gets something else. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken uh, by a true Cardinal fan. Yeah, a topic... I'm, uh, I'm, it's not like I'm bitter or anything. No, I no. I, and, and I haven't it... slept since Saturday. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Not, <laughs> not. Um... So, so Matt, the, one of the rules is Matt Holliday <laughs> does not get one of these darn pills. I think he needs one, actually. I think compassion would require that he uh, – I can think of a lot of aspects of it. Go ahead. Continue. <laughs> so we're, we're going to have to allocate it somehow. Um, it, we could have a lottery or we could have price. And if we used price, I think the point is that everybody would object to this because it would create a two kind of tiered society. So I would wonder if we might not take a vote and outlaw the pill. Yeah, we probably would. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. That's an interesting question. We're about to do that in healthcare, Russ, because <laughs> we're the, the problem is – let's compare this to a liver transplant. Liver transplant costs about $1 $1.2 million by the time you go through all of it. We obviously can't pay $1.2 million for everybody to have a liver transplant. As it stands, some wealthy people and some people who are uh, who have guilt-edged health plans probably can get a liver transplant. If we have a system that rations health care, and maybe it's more rational, I mean, in the sense that why would you spend that much? 70-year-old guy, you're going to give him a, a liver transplant? Well, if we have a, any kind of single-payer plan, basically in Germany or England, it's impossible to get a liver, tran liver transplant operation. Legally. So they've made a Legally. decision not to do it. Legally. Right. That's right. You can go somewhere else, but that's the way laws are. They can only control what's legal. We'd have a law not to have a liver transplant, just like we'd have a law not to do uh, Mancu's Dorian Gray pill. I think it's a fantastic example because it really does raise the, the problem of rationing in healthcare and raise the question are, and with vaccines too. Are we going to do this as a society or are we going to let people make their own choices knowing that some people are going to make bad choices? I guess I disagree with you on this. I, I, don't, um, I don't think it's a good example at all. Uh, I think it's uh, – I'm going to be tough on at least this version of – our version that we're discussing here of Greg's piece. I didn't – I don't remember the whole thing. I read it a few weeks ago and then yeah, I – Yeah, but we've characterized it in a certain way. In a so certain that, way. So I just – Let's call it our example. Yeah, now. I don't want to be unfair to Greg and – Yeah. Uh, but I, I think you're close. Um, I think it's the kind of example that makes for a good high school um, biology class discussion or uh, – Ethics class in, in religious schools, um, you know, you, you've got uh, – it's a classic case in ethics situations. You're, you're, you're on a boat. There's four of you. There's only enough water to save one. Who gets it? And, uh, you know, you can argue as you have. You could say, well, <clears throat> we, should, we should give it to the youngest person. Uh, because that person would get the most benefit because they'd live the longest. We should give it to the most valuable person, which of course is undefinable, and we'd argue about whether that's the the most beautiful or the smartest or the one who's got the best carpentry skills or yeah. uh, can fix a, a, a like you know a wiring problem. Uh, there, there's so many dimensions of valuable, of course, some uh, market based and some not. The best artist, the best singer, the best. The one who'd be the best parent, the best husband, wife, right? We could argue about that. That's that makes good talk for, and it's interesting. I don't. I don't want to devalue it. I think it's an interesting conversation. You learn something from those conversations, and of course, you could say whoever could pay the most for it and 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 compensate, uh, take the money and give it to something, or we could think of all kinds of mechanisms. But I think it's a, it's the wrong question. You know, it, it's good for argument, and it's it's nice for 
dorm rooms late at night if you've had a few drinks, but it's not really... Not anybody at Duke drinks, mind you. Oh, of course not. Or, or here at George Mason. <laughs> uh, but it's not the right question. And the reason it's not the right question is it does not capture... Let me, let me say it differently. If you're in a rowboat and you're stranded at sea and you're trying to, to be saved and you really only have one thing of water for four people, you're really in a terrible situation. And, and it's... My heart goes out to all four of you and... Um, People do brutal and, and grotesque things and honorable and glorious things in under that moral dilemma. But that's not the moral dilemma we're talking about. It's the way people pose the moral dilemma, and I think it's a false way of posing it. And the reason I say that, and you'll uh, you'll respond, is does it correspond to anything in in in, in, in economic life in a market system? Is there anything like that other than a delusion that, that that's the way things are? So, for example, when cars were first invented, only rich people had cars. It's true. Only rich people had cars. And you could have said in 1905 or 1910 or 1920 – maybe 1920 is the wrong year. But early on, you could have said, well, this isn't right that rich people are – scooting along at 20, 30 miles an hour in these vehicles. Poor people are on horses or they're on foot. We, we can't allow rich people to have a radic a two-tiered system because in a matter of time, and it took time, it took, oh, maybe 60 years, over two or three generations, every American, rich and poor, could have a car that got better and better. Now, it's true. Not everybody can have a Lexus. Not everybody can my, – my 11-year-old wants a Ferrari big time, and he's, I hope, in for a life of disappointment. I hope he can never have a Ferrari, and I hope he, if he can, he chooses not to have one, though I think they're a beautiful work of art. But they're very extravagant in my opinion, and I'd rather him spend his money on something else. Yeah, the set of things that would have to be true for him to have a Ferrari, you don't want to be true. Yeah, but you know, it's not my life. It's his life. He'll choose yeah. – he's 11. He doesn't have really a good vision of what his choices <laughs> will be, and that's what makes 11-year-olds so charming. But to say, well, it's not fair that, that, that rich people get the Ferraris and poor people don't, that is true. Rich people do get the Ferraris and poor people don't, but poor people get Hondas, and they're really nice. They're not as nice as a Ferrari, but they get you from A to B just as successfully. So to suggest that there could be a pill, a designer pill, a $150,000 pill a year that would save your life and let you live forever – and that the person who figured that out would not want to share it and make an enormously larger amount of money selling it to lots of people at a lower price and that there would be no incentive or no physical way for that to happen isn't, doesn't correspond to anything in real life that I can think of. It's possible, but is it vaguely realistic? Well, and then there's the, the, there are two different things that his example might illustrate, and you and I took it different ways. Let, let's look at the, the first, which I think the way is how you've interpreted it. Suppose that there's not enough of the stuff. Then we have to decide, are we going to ration it by price, or are we going to ration it by need, or something else? Second, let's suppose that the amount of the stuff responds pretty sharply to the way that we allocate it. Then, are we going to let price cause the increased supply, or are we going to let command cause the increased supply? We're going to let this be organized by the government. Top down versus bottom up. Yeah. So the, the vaccine, I think we agree that the supply is responsive. We can change the amount that's, that's supplied. Nobody wants to let price cause the increased supply, though. They want to have command do it because they trust command more than they do the profit motive. Okay. Now, you're, if I understand you, let's go to the pill, you're saying that you don't like that example and you think it's unrealistic because it's artificially in the there's not enough and we can't make any more. We can't do anything about it. That's right. Yeah. That's, a great, that's a great point. And let me challenge my claim. Does the liver transplant example, is that not a perfect counterexample to my claim that this is not corresponding to anything in real life? I... Here's the thing that I have trouble with all the time, and you may also. An economist is someone who believes, as a matter of moral good, that the infant mortality rate should be positive. Mm -hmm. Some children, when they are born, should die. 
because it's just too expensive in terms of the opportunity cost of the resources that would be required to keep them alive, to keep them alive. We would have to give up education. We'd have to give up nutrition for other children. It's just not worth it. We're going to have to let some of them go. That's what I see this as illustrating, is that we have to, that health care is rationed always. The idea that health care should be free is insane. Because it's not true. It's not true, and liver transplants aren't true. We can't, as a society, afford to be able to give liver transplants or pick your exotic operation and suppose, for the sake of argument, not that it makes you live forever, but you'll live another 10 or 20 years and you will die for sure now. How do we decide how to allocate that? Yeah. Well, I I, want to just challenge a linguistic. You say we can't afford it. We can afford it. It's just that we wouldn't like to, and it's hard to face that, right? We certainly could afford to give everybody a liver transplant at once, Juan. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stick with it. We can't afford it. When when I tell you what you have to give up, Exactly. you're going to say, and that's what afford means. You could buy your kid a Ferrari. You're just a skin flint. I know. I'm a horrible person. I can't believe you could easily do this. Yep. You could you could sell your house, yep. put fifty thousand dollars down, and pay on the two hundred thousand dollar car mortgage. It's just that you don't like your kid. Yeah, that's you true. You can afford it. Yeah, no, you're right. That's right. That's why I like to say I choose not to afford yeah. it. But go ahead. Well, we we choose not to give liver transplants to everybody. If we actually knew the cost, we'd have to say, I'm I'm sorry, you got to go. But my claim is, and maybe this is just sophistry. My claim is is that if we let I mean, the reason the liver transplant is so much more interesting than the Ferrari is that it's really a lot more important. And that's why this is such an interesting issue, right? People say, well, the market's fine for Ferraris, but not for liver transplants. And for me, it goes the other way around. Don't I want the market to be unleashed on liver transplants? Don't I want the economies of scale that normally come with production to come with liver transplants? Don't I want people to make enormous amounts of money? You have finding- now hit- You've now hit the next point in the argument, and this is really crucial. Why are liver transplants so expensive? That's the question. Part of the reason is we don't let people pay for livers. Yep. We bury so many perfectly good livers in people who, if we had agreed to pay their funeral expenses and $50,000, would have said, sure, I'll donate that. So that their kids could have a better life? Yep. But we, we don't allow them to donate it. We, 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 don't allow, we don't allow people who need livers to pay people who on maybe a kind of insurance pool. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, because we're not letting the market operate. Um, it, the liver transplants are also expensive, though, because of the, very, the complexity of the operation that's involved. Uh, there, there probably operative are operative care. Yeah. yeah. And... and that's the, the where I'm really going with this is not that we don't allow any liver transplants. What we can do is say we're going to subsidize some kinds of liver transplants through insurance and other requirements because we require some companies to offer this kind of coverage. But somebody, I don't know, 60, 70, 90, I'm sorry, you don't get a liver transplant. Or we can leave it up to the market. And if the 90-year-old person is rich, they can go somewhere else and buy one. What do you think of that? It really is interesting, isn't it? Because suppose that what they're doing is they go somewhere else, they buy a liver transplant, and that's a liver that could have gone into a 30-year-old person who's very productive, has a family, needs their dad. He doesn't get it because the rich person took it. It's pretty repulsive, isn't it? It's an artificial shortage. So that's one argument. The other argument would be we could certainly look for non-top-down ways to get poorer people into the into the system, right? We could look for charity. We could look for um, foundations that would subsidize artificially but voluntarily the acquisition of livers by younger, more productive, more important people by some standard, right? Yeah, well, one of the questions is the the acquisition of the liver, and the other is to whom does it go? I think most of us are troubled by the idea that the market would handle all of that. But letting the market handle more of the compensation to the person from whom the liver is harvested, because after all, they're they're dead, Um, allowing them to sign a contract saying, in the unlikely event of my death, my liver can be harvested and the compensation will go to my heirs. It's actually a kind of insurance. and It costs me nothing as long as it's voluntary. 
Yeah, it's not uh, – you said in the unlikely event of my death. Of course, it's quite likely. Um, as far as we know, it's about 100 percent, although <laughs> you, you could argue for the rest – for those of us still alive, there's there's a lot of uncertainty about that probability, but most of us think it's close to one. Yeah, but it's, it would be a time when I'm a good donor. Um, so somewhere between the ages of 25 and 55, assuming that I haven't had too much single malt scotch. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd hate to see your liver, my friend. <laughs> <In any>. <laughs> I admit, <laughs> I, have to, I have to opt out. That's fine. My kidneys are extremely efficient, though. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> uh, it is There is a moral issue, I think, that makes some people queasy, including myself. And it is this is a real concern that under that situation, you have what economists call a moral hazard problem. Uh, that both the heirs and um, sometimes the doctors might be over eager to harvest that liver and advance the time of death. Um, it's a really uh, gruesome Monty Python uh, skit along yeah. those lines <laughs> in the meaning of life. Um, and it is an issue. It's happened in in poor societies with imperfect property rights and and bad systems of justice. You can get people murdered for their for their body parts. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where everybody goes. You're right. I'm, I'm talking metaphorically. That's exactly the argument that, that people make. Well, it would, in countries with bad property rights and poor enforcement, this would cause a problem. But it's a problem now because there's a black market in these... That's right. ...in these uh, organs because we have not, in our society, that would be much more difficult, uh, gotten our act together. We also have a slippery slope on the medical side where uh, the willingness to pull the plug on people goes up because doctors want to get access to those yeah. organs, not not for financially profit re- for profit reasons, but because they're making those allocations. That's the discretionary authority that you talked about earlier. That price controls often put power in the hands of particular individuals. Um, yeah. Well, and actually, I think that happens more now than it would under a price system because livers are so precious. So if you have someone who's listed as a donor. They're not going to get any money, but they are listed as a donor. I think now we're more likely to pull the plug because it's so precious. Whereas if there were more of a market in it, we wouldn't value livers so highly. Right now, livers are worth a tremendous amount. That's right. It's a really interesting aspect of the ethics that people often forget. Yeah, so the, 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 they're more scarce now than they would be. And so for that reason, they're more likely to pull the plug now. If you're worried about that, then it cuts the other way. Yeah, that's right. Do you have anything else you want to say on this? Well, we, we had we had talked about talking, and I had kind of foreshadowed it earlier, about um, other kinds of price restriction that increase discretion in ways we not may not be happy about, and that was uh, the minimum wage. And you also, in our pre-podcast uh, conversation, talked about this phenomenon in other, in other countries uh, that use more command and control with artificial prices. There's a, and let, why don't we start with the classic um, Alchin and Allen example of discretion where they pose the problem in a textbook that unfortunately is out of print, though. I think it's kind of come back. Uh, I don't know what its status is right now. But there's a nice article on it in the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics on the library, uh, the online library of liberty. Um, I, and no, at econlive.org, actually, uh, where, right, where, we're, where, we're post, where we're hosted. Uh, uh, we'll post a, a link to that. The, the problem is the following. Why would the people who run the Rose Bowl not try to make as much money as possible? They have these wonderful tickets that there's uh, something like 100,000 seats at the Rose Bowl, but more than 100,000 people want to go. So normally in a market system, the people who have the scarce thing have an incentive to raise the price and make more money. And yet year in, year out, they don't. They leave the price artificially low. And the puzzle is why would you ever do something that seems irrational? And there are many answers to this problem, by the way. It hap- it, it's true across many, many phenomena, um, sports, rock concerts, et cetera, although I think in many situations they're starting to charge closer to the market price. But Elchin and Allen suggested a very interesting reason for why you might want to leave the price artificially low, why you'd want to have – excess demand for those tickets. And the, the specific argument that Alcine and Allen made was that the people who are selling the tickets don't get the difference in price anyway. It's just going to the organization. But if they keep the price low, then they themselves get the benefit of being to allocate a number of these tickets um, to people who value them 
as the market does, a whole lot higher. It gives them discretion. It, it's as if they have the, the kind of the political power of the old kings who might be able to, to give away uh, presents and treasure. And it is interesting, uh, t- Tom Hazlett also has suggested, because the, the, the Federal Communications Commission decided not to auction off electromagnetic spectrum. They were going to give it away. They are going to give it away through a process where they were trying to decide uh, to whom to give it based on an application. So it seems like just a rent-seeking contest. And what we mean by rent-seeking is um, there, there's this thing you're trying to give away, and it's a value. But rent-seeking may dissipate some of that value by making you dig ditches, as we said, said before, or put more effort into the application process in a way that you don't recover through money. Now you've got a pod. We did a podcast on this uh, yeah. with you earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll put a link up to that as well. Yeah. Well, so the but there's an there's something else here. It might not be rent seeking. It might be the discretionary giving away by whoever controls this asset in a way that gives them a lot of power. And so I was at a Liberty Fund conference just this past weekend in Scottsdale, Arizona, where we heard from a lot of Chinese officials about the terrible problems that they have with price ceilings. And price ceilings on their face seem to be motivated by the concern for the citizens. They say, you know, rice is really expensive and it's a big part of our life. Let's just put a ceiling on the price that farmers can charge for the rice that they sell. And that way, everybody can afford it. We'll have cheap rice. Wouldn't that be better? And people vote for this. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of that. But the problem is that that creates a shortage. Farmers are not going to produce as much rice as they would if the price were higher. The shortage of rice, since you also have a ration system with coupons, means that you can give out coupons. Now, the local government official is going to give out more coupons than actually. So there's an inflation in the currency of coupons. Hmm. That gives the, the, the local village official discretion about deciding, okay, you, my brother-in-law, you, you get some rice. You, you disrespected me. You, you don't get any rice. <laughs> I don't like your face. No yeah, rice. I, I, I don't like your, your grandfather's face. I, you're, <laughs> you're a Jew. You're black. You're, you, know, you just – whatever my own discretion, I can act on. No and, rice for you. Or I can sell it out the back door from a black market. So there's this artificial rent that's created. It's dissipated in a thousand ways, and it makes people worse off. But I benefit from it. Here's the beauty part. Who do people blame? The lazy farmers. Look at those farmers. They're not producing enough rice. So as a local official, this is perfect for me. And that's what made me think about the minimum wage. I think people fundamentally misunderstand, and I know you do too, uh, because we've talked about this, but what are the effects of the minimum wage? Economists generally are going to say, and and the the minimum wage is is something different, it's a floor. That is, you can't pay any less, but it still creates a difference between the market price and the price that people are allowed to transact. So a lot of voluntary transactions don't take place. So if I have a job, I get paid more Perhaps, if, if I'm in that kind of marginal job, I get paid more than I would if there were no minimum wage in place. And that, once I have the job, that sort of seems good. Problem is, how about when I'm looking for a job? We, we've done what the minimum wage does is create Marx's reserve army of the unemployed. Yeah. That actually doesn't exist in a situation where, there's, uh, where markets are allowed to function. But that means that there's a whole bunch of people looking for this job. I, 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 as the employer, I look around and I say just the same thing again. I don't like your face. Yeah, I I think it's worse than that, actually. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. It came up in my class recently, in my microeconomics class. I think the way economists look at this is remarkably unimaginative. Um, So let me lay it out. I... The standard way that we teach – not the way I teach it because I've, I'm trying to use my imagination. <laughs> but the standard way that the textbooks teach the effects of, of a price floor like this, a minimum wage, is – well, let's say the abs- – we're talking about, say, the, um, uh, the wage for a particular low-skilled person. So obviously the minimum wage doesn't have a big impact on lots of people in the job market, but for – People with relatively low skills, it's very important. So in the absence of the minimum wage, let's say you'd make $5 an hour, but the minimum wage is seven and a quarter. 
And uh, somebody recently sent me a, a, a quote from uh, Orson Scott Card, the science fiction writer, where he said, well, it's good to have the minimum wage because what it does is it – economists are right. It, most economists agree with this, and let's just assume that this is true, which I think it is, but we're going to work with this, that it does just reduce the number of opportunities available for low-skill workers. Uh, and so – Orson Scott Card says, well, that's good because it's destroying crummy jobs. We don't want those jobs. Those are jobs that people have trouble living on. And I think the standard way that economists then look at this is they say, well, a bunch of people who are making $5 an hour now don't have a job. So those people are hurt. Let's concede that, say the supporters of the minimum wage or the, the, the careful economist. And the people who get the jobs that are still left, they make seven and a quarter, so they're better off. And now we're going to be utilitarians. I'm not, but people in this vein of thought say, I'm going to be a utilitarian. And I'm going to add up the gains to the people who get to keep their jobs and make seven and a quarter. And I'm going to take away the people who lost the five bucks. And now it's a question. It's an empirical question. It's what's the elasticity of the demand for low-skill labor? That is, how responsive, what we talked about earlier, how much does do things respond to price? So if, if we've made – Low-skilled people, more expensive. Yes, true. It's probably going to be the case that there'll be fewer jobs for them. But what if it's not very many fewer? In fact, I'll make it dramatic. So as one person loses their job, but thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people get a raise from 5 to 725. Well, that's surely a good thing, right? So that's the standard empirical way that economists look at the minimum wage. It's a question of you might not literally add up the costs and benefits, but most people, I think, when confronted with this would say, well, some people lose their jobs and that's a shame. But if enough people benefit from a higher wage and it's and it's a better wage, it's a more dignified wage, they can hold their head high, that's what counts. And we have a social safety net for the people who are unemployed. They're really no worse off that's than they were right. with their $5 an hour job. And I think that fundamentally – and I think economists through our – uh, sort of blind application of, of supply and demand, not not imaginative application, totally missed the implications of this. And this really comes, I think it builds on work of uh, Joram Barzell, uh, who, who looked at, at how competition really takes place. So l- let me lay this out. And it, it must be on a different margin then. Exactly. So we understand that price is one way that people compete. So what the minimum wage does is that when it's when the wage is artificially high at seven twenty five, as you point out, more people want to work uh, than there are jobs available, or more accurately, the number of hours that people want to work all mass together combined is greater than the number of hours of work that people employers want to hire. So there's excess supply. Now, normally, excess supply pushes. Wages down from seven to twenty-five, or they would go back down to five. We well, blocked that. We've it stopped do it. that. It's illegal, and we're going to assume it's there's no black market. There's no illegal. Of course, there's plenty of it. But in fact, let's assume not. In fact, in fact, there's plenty of that. But let's assume none of that happens. There's yeah. no black market. It, you get dipped in hot oil and die a horrible death if you're caught violating the law, and so no one wants to risk it. And as a result, everybody keeps the law. So what have you done, as you said? You've created this reserve army of people who would like to work at 725. In a heartbeat. Who can't. Yeah. What but, that, but they're waiting outside. They're not just waiting outside because the person who's, who we think of as the beneficiary, and this is the part I find so, so uh, unimaginable and depressing, the person who's the so-called beneficiary who's now making 725 an hour is really in a position to be exploited by his employer and will often act and exploit himself. Let's think about the different dimensions that a worker and an employer have besides wages for the on-the-job experience. There's how hard you work while you're working. That is, how many breaks you get, how much time off you get. Do there, I assign you a split shift where you work three hours at lunch and then you have to come back for dinner? Yeah. Do you have to pay for your own uniform? Do you get training on the job? Well, most jobs that pay $5 an hour don't have any training. Well, I'm not talking about a formal thing where you go off for three weeks and take some fancy class and learning how to use some equipment or software. or learn. No, they, they don't have sabbaticals. You're not claiming they have sabbaticals. Right, but they have on-the-job training all the time in every job. It's things like you know people trying to desperately get better at what they're doing and that there's mentoring that goes on. All that is going to be reduced. How hard you work, you're going to work harder. One of the reasons you're going to work harder is – and of course, some of these businesses are going to fail. 
This has nothing to do with just the elasticity of labor within a business. Some of the yeah. businesses are some of the jobs are going to disappear because the profitability has been reduced and they were close to failing and now they'll fail and those jobs are going to definitely disappear. But let's talk about the ones that stick around. How hard are you going to work on the job? It's not just that your employer is going to say, you know, I can take advantage of you. You're going to say, hey, if you're smart, if I lose my job or if I quit my job, finding another one's going to be a lot harder because yeah, there I'll are find it. not only are there fewer of them. There are more people trying to get at the scarcer jobs. Yep. So that competition pushes down compensation. It's not allowed to legally push down monetary compensation because that's blocked by the law. It pushes down non-monetary compensation. Yep. I, I don't know if people realize how much – it's kind of like hydraulics. If there's this surplus – it's going to be pushed to some other margin almost automatically. It may just be the abusiveness of the boss. Normally, I would quit. I'm not going to take this, but I can't because exactly. I'm not going to find another job at this wage. There's all sorts of difficult things that – and we've seen examples of it over and over again in kind of the other direction. You may remember when they tried to regulate regulate airline prices – in the 60s, say, then put a, a ceiling. You can, on any city pricing pair, you couldn't raise your your your. Uh, couldn't lower rate. your price. No, you couldn't lower your you price. You couldn't lower it, right? You you couldn't lower it more below a, a certain level. So uh, we we can't compete on price. So they started competing on the kind of meals that they offered. First, there were sandwiches, and then there were steaks. They tried to limit that by saying you couldn't have a steak. And so Eastern Airline, which is now bankrupt, famously had a lunch, which was a large sirloin steak between two tiny pieces of bread. And they called that a sandwich. <laughs> but it was about a 15 or $20 lunch. Even then, it was a very expensive with wine. And the other way, of course, they competed, which is uh, – which again is hard to see. But the other way they competed was they would offer more flights per connecting cities so that the load factor would be lower. So it would be more pleasant and comfortable. Both you'd have more choices and when you were on the flight, you had more room to stretch out. Uh, some, some of it was easier to see. The, uh, there were more stewardesses and they were extremely attractive. Yeah. And so they, just like they the food, it. the food was more attractive and yeah. the stewardesses yeah. and the upholstery. Everything got better. Yeah. But they here's the here's the irony. That mix of price and quality was not the mix that the consumer wanted. No. The consumer would have preferred a different mix. This was an artificially attractive mix. And the cool thing about your example is that the guy employed at a minimum wage would prefer a different mix. He actually exactly. I think, would prefer his market wage and being treated better. And having more breaks and yep. getting more on the job training and have a better chance of promotion and have more uh, all kinds of on-the-job experiences that are now going to be destroyed. Now, of course, it's not true for every single worker. There's some employers who are going to say, I'm not going to take advantage of my workers. Yeah. I'm going to be just as nice, just as pleasant. I'm going to be just – I'm going to make a little less money because I'm not going to fire anybody. I'm going to keep the same number of workers. I'm not going to substitute machines for people. I bet that was true two years ago. You know, I'm not sure now because they're being pressed. And so even if you did have a minimum wage job where you weren't being pressed at different margins, they're probably having to press now because the, the wage is too high. Yeah, well, obviously you can make it high enough that it would be impossible to indulge that normal human uh, – the milk of human kindness. What, what's ironic about it is that the employer who responds to the incentives right, is an exploiter, and it's true. Yeah. It's true. They're going to be – they're going to bark at their workers. Yeah. They're going to give them nothing above and beyond the the, the, the wages, no benefits, no, uh, no health care, no uniform, uh, no ride to and from work on the way if I'm living near you. I'm going to treat you badly because yeah, I'm paying be, you – There'll be high turnover. Paying you seven twenty five an hour. No, it's not going to be high turnover. Well, well they'll, 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 they will fire people at, at the drop of a hat. No, that's true. Sorry. Yeah, that's correct. Nobody's going to quit though. No, no, no quitting. But I meant firing. Correct. So I can be I can be impulsive. I can be, yeah. uh, and then people are going to say, "See that? That's what happens with greedy employers." Yeah. But what they've Just done, like the farmers in, in, in China, exactly. And yet, it's the law. It is the 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 price, the interference in the price mechanism that's created that that environment. Yeah. And it, it wouldn't be there. The beauty of the marketplace when it's allowed to work is that it encourages people to be decent human beings, and it takes something like this. Yeah. An artificial wage to get people to be to, to be to afford to they can afford to be cruel. Yeah. In, in another market now now let's let's look at the flip side. 
The flip side is, oh, come on. This is ridiculous. You're going to tell me that in the absence of the minimum wage, that, that poor people, low-skilled people, high school dropouts making five bucks an hour are going to get health care benefits and, and wonderful treatment on the job and, and friendly employers. Is that true? At, at, at the margin, all these things operate at the margin. It has to be true that Raising the wage and not allowing people to compete on that margin means that they're going to compete on something else, and workers are going to exploit themselves in the presence of a minimum wage. So let's be um, – let me play a different role of devil's advocate against my own position. You know, this – here's two economists talking, living in their own fantasy world about – of competition. You know, we think competition can solve all problems, always works to help the consumer – always works to help the worker. Isn't that naive? I mean, is it really true that these kind of non-price competitions really happen? Or is this just some textbook thing that economists think of? I mean, is it really – is this just our religion, You know, our, our worldview? You said it has to be true. Isn't that just – are you just acting like a, some kind of faith-based economist? <laughs> well, I, to quote I, Ed I, Lemer. Yeah, I, I, I've seen it. I've, I have seen it often at the other end, where uh, if if you close off one margin, I'm pretty confident that competition, which we do see at the in the in the output marketplace, is going to drive people to compete on other margins in the labor market. And I myself worked for a minimum wage job for two summers. I wouldn't have been able probably to find a job if the minimum wage had been higher. Suppose it had been what they call a living wage now, um, $14, 10, 11, $18 yeah. an hour. Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends what you think a living is. Yeah, it's true. Um, I wouldn't have been able to find a job. I wouldn't have been able to work my way through college. There's a lot of people who, for a head start, need that. So I guess my own experience was, with this was having myself worked at a minimum wage job where I learned quite a bit and was able to find another job. Now, that's a, a sample of one. Obviously, but I, I do have some experience with this. Raising the minimum wage means that some people who are economically marginal are able to find some kind of foothold in the market system, have a job, begin to develop work skills, and maybe move to something else. Now, sure, some people don't, but this is a pretty big margin to go from five dollars to seven twenty-five. In your example, that's a big increase. Yeah, and I think that's. Uh... That that is part of the part of the question is how you know how large and how dramatic the effects are. I think it's interesting. If I said let's let's make it fifty dollars an hour, uh, most people would be would understand what the effects were. But again, I think w- what I'm trying to sell here, and I and I think it's true. And there have been some studies of this, by the way. I'm not just we're not just fantasizing here about possible effects. Let's see if I can dig some of those up for the for the links. But it's obviously true that if you price if you artificially price stuff high enough or low enough, you're going to see quantity responses. What I think is interesting are these non-quantity responses, these non, uh, these sort of hidden aspects of on-the-job employment. And I don't, I don't know if it is uh, how important they would be in other markets. You know, the standard story is in in rent-controlled markets. Obviously, the uh, landlord doesn't paint the paint the apartment very often. It doesn't fix the toilet. Slow to repair stuff. You end up fixing a lot of stuff yourself. Uh, chooses people, as you say, on discriminatory ways, although there's laws often against it. Those laws oh, are yeah, diff- against the law. <laughs> They're di- but it's difficult to enforce. <laughs> Don't laugh. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I lost control. <laughs> but you know, the, these things do clearly do happen, and I guess it's a question of what their magnitudes are. Um, uh, I'm just trying to imagine what non-economists would think of our... Well, we, we do always have that sort of fallback, don't we? We're, you know, we're economists. So it happens at the margin. I don't know what the magnitude of the effect is. I think it happens at the margin. And it would be interesting to know how much that margin is. I guess what I think is important about the issue that you've raised about minimum wage is I would, I'm willing to bet almost none of the listeners have ever thought about that kind of competition for jobs expressing itself as competition along other margins other than wage before. So just raising the question and saying, this is a possible cost of minimum wage or prices on rice or prices on apartments. 
that you may not have thought of it. Let's take that into account. Let's put it in as part of the decision process. I don't know if it's big enough to worry about, but let's at least make sure we're aware of it. So today is October 14th, and uh, earlier this week, Eleanor Ostrom and Oliver Williamson were uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. And one of the reasons that uh, Eleanor Ostrom got it uh, was for empirical work that she's done in studying tragedy of the commons problems, problems with common resources and how uh, groups of people have responded to that challenge through non-monetary cultural norms, um, uh, voluntary agreements outside of the standard way economists look at these problems. The standard way economists look at problems of the commons is either, well, I guess the, you know it's, it's going to be ruined because there, there's a problem of, of the commons. Uh, yeah. The, the fishery is going to be fished to, to, to zero. We're going to the, – the species will be, go extinct. The common – Grazing ground is going to be eaten to a nub, and therefore we have to have a subsidy tax regulation, et cetera. Yeah, that was certainly Garrett Hardin's conclusion was only government can solve this. And Eleanor Ostrom had the intelligent thought, which it's amazing how many Nobel Prizes. I can think of at least three, her, Coase, and, and Stigler, who said, I wonder if it's true. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that's right. <laughs> is, is it true that, that they just ruin it and it, and it gets – Eaten down to a knob. And, and yeah, the answer is sometimes, but wouldn't it be amazing if, it if people otherwise. who faced this problem over and over again didn't say, you know, maybe we can come up with some kind of institution to solve it? So one of the reasons she got the Nobel Prize is for that work, which is a type of work that is kind of – not kind of – is very much disdained by most economists, and it's it's quite embarrassing to read. That's why I'm in a political science department, Russ. As is she, um, <laughs> which is that – she does case studies. She went and looked and saw what different groups of people did in different situations. So kind of what I'm pleading for here, I guess, the, to integrate your uh, observation that, well, maybe this matters and mine is saying, yeah, don't, don't we want to worry about this? Wouldn't it be nice if economists studied this? It's incredible how many studies have been done of the quantity response. Uh, which until recently with Card and Kruger, those quantity response studies were all the same. Yeah. Minimum wage reduces employment. Uh, Card and Kruger claimed it actually increases it. I don't know if their work will stand the test of time. I'm skeptical of it, and I'm actually even uh, skeptical of some of the other work that, that supports my view that the minimum wage, the minimum wage is not so high because I think it's very difficult to actually tease out the impacts of – a national small, usually not dramatic increase in the minimum wage on the national market for uh, low-skill labor. Yeah, it's not really a macro effect that we're talking it's very about. very small, uh, although the recent jump in teenage unemployment uh, is suggestive that maybe this recent increase in matter, but it could just be a coincidence. It could be due to other factors. It's, it's hard to know. Yeah. But it would be useful, and again, I know there's been some work on this, but it would be useful to look at the non- quantitative measures and that that you can't run a regression so it doesn't get very often so it's hard in that study so it's hard to do but it would be useful to try to see how the nature of the workplace has changed in response to changes like this or the nature of uh, rent control and I, again I know people have looked at this I'll, tr I'll try to find some of the references but there hasn't been a lot of work on it and it might be a fruitful area for people to consider which is to study how competition actually works as opposed to just saying supply and demand cross, or they don't, and therefore we're done. Yeah, yeah. It, it is interesting to try, I guess I would like to, to talk to employers or to, to workers and maybe uh, if you could get some kind of natural experiment where there's a change. And to, to be fair, that's some of what Carton Kruger tried to exploit. But I, I don't think they looked very much at anything beyond changes in price and changes in levels of employment. Well, they sent out a survey and said, you know, are you going to hire more people or did you hire more people, which is has many of the problems that, he, that a national study, study that's macro-oriented has. You, you don't know what other factors have changed. They tried to control for that. They did the best they could. It's an interesting and provocative study. Yeah, but, and, and more power to them. That, that, that's fine. That's right. But the question is, is that on a, a more sociological style case study basis, what might you uncover – when you saw, like you said, a natural experiment, I remember, oh, a few years ago, the city of Santa Fe raised their living wage to something dramatic. It wasn't a small change like most minimum wage changes of uh -huh. a quarter or 50 cents. They went, they raised it for something like 7 to 14 or 7 yeah. to 11. 
And there was a very poignant, to me, article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine where they interviewed a bunch of people struggling to get by, as I'm sure they did, on the low wages they were earning and now facing the prospect of a big raise and what they would do with the money. The poignance of the article was nobody – the reporter didn't think to ask, are you worried you might lose your job as a yeah. result of this? It would be very interesting to go back to those folks and ask them what their lives – how their well, lives changed. Because when you think about it, what happens in a neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, when housing prices go up? You get gentrification. Why wouldn't that happen with this move to a living wage? Why don't you get job gentrification now who people who before would not have applied for this position? Say, $14 an hour, I have a college degree. I'm going to apply for that. They crowd out all of the residents of this neighborhood who used to live in the low-wage area, and it becomes a high-wage area. But it becomes it's job gentrification in the sense that the people holding these jobs are crowded out. Maybe they're fired. Maybe it's just hard for them to compete with the people who are now much more motivated because of the much higher salary. It's not true that things just stay static and you give them more money. And once again, illustrates the – it's a great analogy, by the way. It once again illustrates the essence of economics, which is and then what, um, yeah, yeah. which is I, – I, I attribute it to Thomas Sowell. I don't know if that's accurate. If anybody knows where Sowell said that or whether it's true that he's the first person to put those words in quotes. Um, and then what really is the essence of the economic way of thinking, that you can't hold everything else constant and the good economist is the person who figures out what comes next? What are the ways that people respond to the new set of incentives that are in place? You want to say anything else, Mike? I'm I'm thinking about the the end. The then what thing? If we could just get more people to say instead of this is comparative statics and here's the new equilibrium. Yeah, seems saying like saying it. Then what means that you're almost not qualified to be an economist anymore in many academic departments. Yeah, I, I, and I, to come back to my earlier um, way of thinking about this, I like to think that understanding economics improves your imagination, not in the way we usually think of it as you know a fantasy where. It's can, can I reverse that? Improving yeah. your your imagination may help you to understand <laughs> economics. Yeah, that's a much better way to say it. <laughs> but but they but they work back and forth. That that when you start to think about say how competition works, you can see the hidden unseen stuff that. You'd miss otherwise. Yeah, and that's really what Bastiat meant when he talked about the seen and the unseen. It's a requirement of imagination. I just, I'd never thought of it that way before. So thank you, Russ. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, uh, look forward to our next imaginative session. <laughs> My guest today has been Mike Munger of the, of the Perfect Liver and the Perfect University. Mike, thanks as always for being part of Econ Talk. It's been a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.